This video is one that I've been trying to make for about a month and a half now, and it's become increasingly more complex as time has gone on. I've now played 500 hours of Battlefield 5, and we're counting the closed alpha, the beta, and the full release into that number, all the way from 2018 until early 2020. Now, 500 hours is not an insignificant amount of time, it's just over 20 full days. And there are certainly plenty of other things that you can do with that amount of time. So, was it worth it? Hopefully, I can give you some of my opinions and summaries in this video today. It is a long one, so be aware of that, but I've got a lot that I want to talk about. Also, if you're a regular watcher of this channel and you aren't subscribed yet, please do consider clicking that subscribe button. Around 58% of the views on this channel come from non-subscribed viewers, and it'd be great if we could keep growing this community here. We're now another 5,000 subs past 500,000, which is amazing, so if you're not subscribed, please do click that subscribe button. To begin with, we're going to go back to the reveal of Battlefield 5 nearly two years ago in May 2018. This set the course for Battlefield 5, and unfortunately, it wasn't a good course. A rather polarising reveal trailer split the community right down the middle. Many people argued that DICE wasn't paying proper tribute to the conflict that they were depicting, and other people were willing to give DICE a little bit more time to try and show what game they were creating. And really, that was the first issue. I don't think it was clear at all what DICE was trying to do with Battlefield 5. The reveal show told us the game would be taking a more tactical, hardcore route in terms of gameplay. But the visual style of the game told us that we'd be seeing World War II as we'd never seen it before. So the two points were kind of at odds with each other. The reveal trailer, that was full of characters wearing odd outfits, one sporting a prosthetic arm and the other one looking suspiciously like Kratos from the God of War franchise. It's hard to then see how DICE was going to produce something more hardcore and more tactical when the game looked anything but hardcore and tactical. I remember the night of the reveal show, which I attended in London. I was standing there talking to others about how I wasn't sure if Battlefield 5 was going to be the game that we all wanted. The great return to World War II. And in reality, I think it should have been a fairly easy feat to nail for the DICE studio. World War II first-person shooter games dominated the early 2000s. The original Battlefield title, 1942, that depicted the war across vast battlefields, 64-player combat, vehicles and weaponry from the era. DICE had been there and done World War II already, as had countless other development studios. So you'd think that bringing World War II to life in 2018 on a state-of-the-art game engine like Frostbite with destruction capabilities, top-of-the-line visuals, and the last 10 years worth of Battlefield tech to draw from, you'd kind of think this would be a home run swing for DICE, especially coming off the back of Battlefield 1. But it wasn't. It was a complete misswing, and that set the course for the rest of the game's life. At this point, at the reveal, I was concerned that it wasn't going to appeal to players in the same way that previous franchise entries had. But that was just the first showing, so I was willing to give it a little bit more time to try and better portray itself. Moving on from the reveal and the time in between, we come to the alpha phase, which is the first time that players were able to get their hands on Battlefield 5. And I think here the mood slightly changed. Instead of players basing their opinions on what they were seeing or what they were being told by EA and DICE, we could all get a feel for the game by properly trying it out. The alphas revealed a much better weapon balancing and gunplay system than the previous title, Battlefield 1, and it also highlighted a brand new feature to the franchise, fortifications. These were the counters to destruction. They allowed players for the first time to properly rebuild the battlefield as rounds played out, constructing sandbag walls in place of real walls that had been destroyed, setting up tank traps on roads, building trench networks in open fields. It was a great step forwards for the Battlefield franchise. The franchise had long been praised for its destructive environments, but it had also been criticised at the same time, sometimes leading gameplay to break down due to a lack of solid cover. The fortification system provided a dynamic solution to that problem, allowing players the freedom to choose how they wanted the cover to operate once the map had taken a little beating from some explosives. Other features, such as attrition and a more direct focus on squad play, they shone through as well, affecting general gameplay in a way not previously seen in the franchise. 
players weren't able to automatically regen health, and they had to rely on scavenging for ammunition off of dead players, and that added that more hardcore feeling to the game. That part of DICE's reveal pitch, creating a more tactical shooter feel, that was being executed on. However, the alpha also reaffirmed DICE's art direction with the game, and decisions around the way World War II was being portrayed. Soldiers in eye-raising outfits dominated the gameplay sessions, and largely dominated the coverage of the game during the summer of 2018, and that caused some further rifts in the community, some players largely willing to ignore the cosmetic decisions that DICE was making, and others flat out refusing to accept DICE's portrayal of World War II as anything but an insult. And then if you add into that, issues with player visibility rising from the alpha due to the extremely high fidelity assets that DICE was producing and the colouring of soldiers blending into backgrounds easily, it made for a rather difficult experience. Whatever side of the fence you sit on, I think we can all agree that DICE was failing to shake what was already a very polarising image for the game. And you don't often get a second chance at a first impression. The alpha stage was that second chance, and DICE didn't do themselves any favours. This is the point where I genuinely began to feel that Battlefield 5 was not on the right path. Then we swing into the beta, where Battlefield 5 was just coming off a launch delay announcement. A few days before the preload and early access to the beta started, DICE and EA announced that the release date of Battlefield 5 was being pushed back by a month into November. The cited reasons for this delay were to make sure that the team had sufficient time to polish the game up for a smooth launch, and to make some final adjustments to the core gameplay. Now when you're making adjustments to the core gameplay only two months out from your original release date, well that's going to set some alarm bells ringing. If you need to make changes to the game's core values so late in the day, that tells me that the game wasn't hitting the audience in the way it was intended to, which confirmed my earlier concerns that the game just wasn't on the right path. The feedback pouring in from players was that, first of all, the game still didn't feel like a World War II game, and that the way DICE was depicting it was insensitive, and secondly, that certain features that sounded great on paper weren't actually translating into good gameplay. Features such as attrition and the lack of health regen meant for a far more punishing experience than any previous Battlefield had offered in its standard modes. It felt like playing extreme hardcore from past games, and that usually required players to join specific servers for that experience. DICE's response was to massively tone down attrition, making ammo a lot more plentiful, and offering players more health options by increasing the amount of stations on the map that you could heal from. These changes completely diverted from the game's already sketchy vision by toning down aspects that were explicitly used to try and tell players what the game was going to be. And it felt as if DICE themselves didn't really know what Battlefield 5 was supposed to be. If the team did know, then I'm confident that they wouldn't have been so quick to change anything. However, at the same time, where they were changing stuff in terms of gameplay, the team remained staunchly committed to their artistic vision, and yet again, just like the reveal, two major aspects of the game were so strikingly opposed to one another. Then after the beta, you of course have launch and beyond. Battlefield 5 suffered a pretty miserable launch. The month's delay was clearly not enough time for the team to check in bug fixes, implement changes, and polish off the experience properly. The game should have been delayed for quite a bit longer. The game launched in a really poor state, performance-wise, with core features like progression not working properly. The lack of content, which players were already concerned about based on trailers and articles that were posted before launch, was now clear and obvious to everyone. The game launched with only eight multiplayer maps. That was one less than Battlefield 1, and I remember people complaining about that, and two less than Battlefield 4. And the maps that were included in the launch weren't anywhere near as enthralling or exciting as perhaps they could have been. The only maps from the launch lineup that I really liked were Devastation, which depicted the aftermath of the Rotterdam bombings, giving a truly grim feeling, and Arras, the rolling hills of the French countryside. The other maps, they kind of just felt like they were there. There was nothing really special about them, and to be brutally honest, there's nothing really that special about Devastation or Arras either. The Grand Operations mode, another flagship point 
of Battlefield 5, used heavily in marketing, was largely considered a downgrade over the Battlefield 1 incarnation. The progression systems within the game were severely lacking and launched with bugs, allowing players to reach max rank in some cases inside a week from the launch of the game. With no additional systems in place to allow for continued grinding after the fact, the weapon customization system took away direct attachment additions and replaced it with flowcharts applying invisible upgrades to guns. Not only did that feel like an extremely weak implementation, but it goes against the physical direction that DICE had been quoted on several times during the build-up to the launch. It denied players the opportunity to physically apply attachments that they wanted on their guns. The physical attachments were then tied into the cosmetic customization system, meaning that if players wanted to have a certain stock or a certain muzzle on their gun, they would have to purchase the appropriate weapon skin with grind currency. Then, the grind currency handouts, they didn't work properly, because the end of round screen was broken, and that took several months for DICE to fix. And then just a couple of months later, DICE decided to take that feature away and hand out grind currency via the career rank system. The whole setup was all over the place. And that's not even mentioning that three weeks after launch, DICE tried to erase one of the diamonds in the rough in Battlefield 5. They tried to change the gunplay. After three weeks, DICE decided that the gunplay, the time to kill, it was too fast and they wanted to scale things back, much to the anger of the community. A week later, after massive community outcry, the change was reverted. That kind of change at that period of time showed me that either DICE wasn't listening to its current player base, or simply they didn't understand their own product and what elements of it were actually good elements. After the launch, we then moved into the live service of Battlefield 5. DICE made a big song and dance about the fact that they were moving away from the premium system used in previous titles and onto a live service that they were calling the Tides of War. That would provide free content updates to Battlefield 5, and funding the development of the game would come via cosmetic microtransactions such as weapon skins and soldier outfits. That sounds pretty cool in concept, but in practice, it's been far less than impressive. Initially, DICE struggled to get content rolling into the game at the rate that players were previously used to, having been conditioned to expect larger content drops in the form of DLCs from the premium days. Instead, DICE was using a drip feed system, dropping new items into the game every week or so, and allowing the community to get their hands on that and then use it till the next thing arrived. Again, in theory, this is a much more efficient method of adding content into a video game because each thing you add gets more attention from every player for a slightly longer period of time. However, in the case of Battlefield 5, the content wasn't what people expected, and it wasn't arriving in the timeframes that players expected. The first post-launch map, that arrived in December, about a month after launch. That also happened with Battlefield 1, so DICE were on a good track there. But then the next map, that didn't arrive until June, six months later. By comparison, Battlefield 4 released a complete four-map DLC just a month after launch, another four-map DLC two months after that, and then another four-map DLC six weeks later. Battlefield 1, that delivered a post-launch map and then a full DLC by the following March, which was then subsequently added to with two more maps. Battlefield 5's one map paled in comparison to previous Battlefield games, and the promise that DICE had made to provide a live service for the game, it wasn't living up to community expectations. The service was there, you can't deny that. Updates were coming through, and content was being added. But the content people cared about wasn't being added. Maps are, still to this day, the number one piece of content that Battlefield players care about, and unfortunately, DICE hadn't positioned their development team to make sure that maps were being consistently delivered. At this point, there were a lot of people who were actually stating that Premium would have been better because it would have forced DICE to release content, but the content simply wasn't there. The Mercury map wasn't anywhere near ready to be released, and so having Premium, all that would have done is create more anger because Premium costs nearly the same as the base game and the content wouldn't have arrived when it was stated to. 
Me personally, I was just really disappointed because DICE had put a lot of emphasis on this live service, updates coming out all the time, new content every week, but the content was fairly hollow. It wasn't the kind of content the Battlefield players expected, and therefore the whole thing just kind of became very disappointing. After this, we had Firestorm. This was Battlefield's answer to the Battle Royale craze. Developed by Criterion Games, the mode became part of Battlefield 5 when it launched, and unfortunately died about three weeks later. This was down to poor positioning of the mode. It was included as part of a $60 product when all other Battle Royales were moving or had moved to a free-to-play model, making it a really hard sell. And secondly, because the mode just didn't really technically stand up to other offerings on the market. At its core, Firestorm embodied what Battlefield was all about. It had team play elements like capturing objectives, you had to work together to unlock vehicles from their location, and the destruction really provided that unique selling point. And I for one really did enjoy the mode when it launched, and I spent plenty of time playing it, but after a short while, it became clear that the mode was a bit handicapped and simple things were what the mode was failing on. For example, looting wasn't handled in a death box like other battle royales, and that complicated the looting process where all the items would overlap. There was no option to play as a pair at launch, there was no duos. Matchmaking only supported solos and squads. The 64 player cap, that was a big issue. Halvoy is one of the largest battle royale maps out on the market and so having 64 players on it made for a really slow experience because players were relatively spread out. And also, there were relatively no memorable areas on the map either. It was a beautiful map, but it wasn't particularly memorable. After just a couple of updates from DICE, who took over development of the mode from Criterion when it released, the team placed the mode on indefinite hiatus, citing the need to work on the core Battlefield 5 experience instead. This signaled to me that DICE was starting to understand that they were dealing with a relatively bad situation. They chose not to support, improve, and build on a game mode that was built to compete in the exploding Battle Royale market. The core multiplayer experience needed all the attention it could get, so DICE cut Firestorm loose. After Firestorm began the build-up to the Pacific, a section of redemption and further downfall. The Pacific was Battlefield 5's finest hour, at least the launch of it. At a recording event in Stockholm that I attended at the DICE studio, a presentation was given by senior figures within the DICE team, and they told us how they'd really listened to feedback from players, taken it on board about the gameplay experience of Battlefield 5, the depiction of World War II, and they'd used all of that to craft the invasion fantasy of the Pacific Theatre of War. Iwo Jima and Pacific Storm, the two launch maps, are perhaps some of Battlefield 5's best, really leaning into the World War II setting and letting the sandbox chaos that we know and love Battlefield 4 reign supreme. Storming the beaches of Iwo Jima as the American forces whilst being shelled and bombed by Japanese fighters from above. The scrambling through the grasslands, the screaming, the shouting, the flamethrowers ripping through the air, the iconic weaponry, the landing craft, everything. DICE nailed it. They 100% nailed it. And they had finally understood what players had been asking for from a World War II battlefield game. Lars Gustafsson, veteran developer at DICE, was one of the core figures in producing this expansion, and I think that outwardly showed to the community that DICE did know what they wanted to do with Battlefield 5, that there was a vision for the future. It's just that the last 12 months had been one big mess that they were trying to put behind them. At this point, my confidence in Battlefield 5 grew massively, because DICE had played their card and they'd shown me and the rest of the community that they could do once again what they'd already done hundreds of times before. They'd produced the epic scale, the all-out warfare, the sandbox action, the stuff that we love Battlefield for. And then, just as Battlefield 5 was finally riding on a high, it all came tumbling down. All the excitement, all the good sentiment, the community joy, it was just put out in a series of calamitous updates and changes. Update 5.2, the patch after the Pacific was introduced, it changed core gunplay and weapon balance of Battlefield 5, and it mimicked the changes forced upon the game back in late 2018. 
The change was explained as a way to eliminate frustrating deaths at long range and reduce the average engagement distance to bring it in line with the rest of the franchise. However, it just straight up didn't work that way, and the update botched the entire weapon balance, turning powerful guns into glorified pea shooters. A hotfix released just before Christmas, and that undid some of the damage, but it still left the weapon balance in a terrible position for, I think, three months until update 6.2 arrived in March, finally reverting things and properly implementing those goals that DICE originally stated. But in doing that, in fixing what they broke, that didn't erase the fact that DICE once again decided to go against the will of their core community for the game and implement changes that the community felt was unnecessary. That then eroded my hope once again for Battlefield 5. So, were my 500 hours of Battlefield 5 gameplay well spent? I'm guessing from the tone of this video you can probably tell what my answer is going to be, but it's a little bit more complicated, so let me explain it. The answer is yes and no. Let's start with no. I've endured months of buggy gameplay, performance issues and delayed updates in a game that depicts World War II in a really weird way. It's a depiction that I continue to struggle with because it just doesn't feel like World War II. I've played through a live service that took six or seven months to actually kick in, enduring months of little to no meaningful content added to the game. And that content when it did arrive was riddled with bugs and issues rendering it almost useless until it was fixed. I sat through months of limited time game modes, enjoying them, and then having them taken away again to return to the standard modes that don't invoke the same level of enjoyment. I've had to take on board multiple excuses and explanations from EA and DICE about why things aren't the way they should be. And we're now drawing closer to the two year mark of Battlefield 5's reveal. And I don't think the game has really delivered at all when it comes to an engaging, fun and enjoyable experience. Besides the six week period after the Pacific launched. That's really the only time that I can say with confidence that I have fully enjoyed playing Battlefield 5 in my usual style and manner. All the other times, there's been something niggling away that has meant that the experience isn't what it should have been. And then the yes side of my answer. I do think my time was well spent because as proven with this video, where I've made countless points, I have experience in what a Battlefield game shouldn't be. Battlefield 5 is the franchise example of what not to do. Don't twist history in a way that doesn't improve the experience. Don't say things like, if you don't like it, don't buy it, because you make yourself a massive target and it makes things worse for longer. Don't tell your community you're going to provide a live service and then provide little to no meaningful content for months on end. Don't rush out a AAA product in far too short a time frame. Don't try to divert the franchise in a more hardcore tactical direction when the entire history of the franchise has been inherently casual. If you're going to do that, spin it off and make a sub-franchise or make a brand new franchise. It doesn't have to be a Battlefield game. Don't take your mainline numbered series and deviate from the formula that has served you so incredibly well for nearly two decades. Don't spread your offering so wide that each element then falls massively short. Battlefield 5 had a single player, a co-op, a battle royale and a main multiplayer. And three of those elements were made by just one team. That stretched everything way too thin and the result was a subpar experience in every area. The single player, it lacked emotion and it lacked historical impact. The co-op, that was completely different to what was originally advertised. There was no AI system to invent new scenarios each week. Instead, it was just this bland, static, pre-made mission offering on multiplayer maps. The Battle Royale, it was true to what Battlefield is, but it lacked the proper support after launch to ever really stand a chance of succeeding. And the multiplayer, the element of Battlefield that everyone knows and loves, it fell limp from a lack of content and completely misguided direction. Or no direction, as the case may be. My 500 hours of Battlefield 5 have been full of frustration and anguish with just a sprinkling of excitement on top. No previous game in the franchise I've ever played has given me this experience that I've had with this one. And so while a lot of you might then consider or conclude that my 500 hours was a waste of time, I don't really see it that way. I've now experienced, hopefully, the worst of Battlefield. And in the future, 
I'll know how bad things can really get before they get better. Thanks very much for watching. If you made it all the way through, that's amazing. I don't expect anybody to sit through a 25 minute video, so thank you very, very much. Leave some comments and some thoughts down below in the comments section and leave the video a like as well. That's always appreciated. And I'll catch you all in the next one.